Chapter Three of Out of Time's Abyss. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ralph Snelson. Out of Time's Abyss by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Three. Half stunned, Bradley lay for a minute as he had fallen and then slowly and painfully wriggled into a less uncomfortable position. He could see nothing of his surroundings in the gloom about him until after a few minutes his eyes became accustomed to the dark interior when he rolled them from side to side in survey of his prison. He discovered himself to be in a bare room which was windowless, nor could he see any other opening than that through which he had been lowered. In one corner was a huddled mass that might have been almost anything from a bundle of rags to a dead body. Almost immediately after he had taken his bearings, Bradley commenced working with his bonds. He was a man of powerful physique, and as from the first he had been imbued with a belief that the fiber ropes were too weak to hold him, he worked on with firm conviction that sooner or later they would part to his trainings. After a matter of five minutes he was positive that the strands about his wrists were beginning to give, but he was compelled to rest then from exhaustion. As he lay, his eyes rested upon the bundle in the corner, and presently he could have sworn that the thing moved. With eyes straining through the gloom, the man lay watching the grim and sinister thing in the corner. Perhaps his overwrought nerves were playing a sorry joke upon him, he thought of this, and also that his condition of utter helplessness might still further have stimulated his imagination. He closed his eyes and sought to relax his muscles and his nerves. But when he looked again he knew that he had not been mistaken. The thing had moved. Now it lay in a slightly altered form and farther from the wall. It was nearer him. With renewed strength Bradley strained at his bonds his fascinated gaze still glued upon the shapeless bundle. No longer was there any doubt that it moved. He saw it rise in the center several inches and then creep closer to him. It sank and rose again, a headless, hideous, monstrous thing of menace. Its very silence rendered it the more terrible. Bradley was a brave man. Ordinarily his nerves were of steel, but to be at the mercy of some unknown and nameless horror to be unable to defend himself, it was these things that almost unstrung him, for at best he was only human. To stand in the open, even with the odds all against him, to be able to use his fists, to put up some sort of defense, to inflict punishment upon his adversary, then he could face death with a smile. It was not death that he feared now, it was that horror of the unknown that is part of the fiber of every son of woman. Closer and closer came the shapeless mass. Bradley lay motionless and listened. What was that he heard? Breathing? He could not be mistaken. And then from out of the bundle of rags issued a hollow groan. Bradley felt his hair rise upon his head. He struggled with the slowly parting strands that held him. The thing beside him rose up higher than before and the Englishman could have sworn that he saw a single eye peering at him from among the tumbled cloth. For a moment the bundle remained motionless, only the sound of breathing issued from it. Then there broke from it a maniacal laugh. Cold sweat stood upon Bradley's brow as he tugged for liberation. He saw the rags rise higher and higher above him, until at last they tumbled upon the floor from the body of a naked man, a thin, a bony, a hideous caricature of a man that mouthed and mummed and, wobbling upon its weak and shaking legs, crumpled to the floor again, still laughing, laughing horribly. It crawled toward Bradley. "'Food! Food!' it screamed. "'There is a way out! There is a way out!' Dragging itself to his side, the creature slumped upon the Englishman's breast. Food! it shrilled as with its bony fingers and its teeth it sought the man's bare throat. Food! There is a way out! Bradley felt teeth upon his jugular. He turned and twisted, shaking himself free for an instant, 
but once more with hideous persistence the thing fastened itself upon him. The weak jaws were unable to send the dull teeth through the victim's flesh, but Bradley felt it pawing, 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 like a monstrous rat seeking his life's blood. The skinny arms now embraced his neck, holding the teeth to his throat against all his efforts to dislodge the thing. Weak as it was, it had strength enough for this in its mad efforts to eat. Mumbling as it worked, it repeated again and again, Food! Food! There is a way out! Until Bradley thought those two expressions alone would drive him mad. And all but mad he was, as with a final effort, backed by almost maniacal strength, he tore his wrist from the confining bonds, and grasping the repulsive thing upon his breast, hurled it halfway across the room. Panting like a spent hound, Bradley worked at the thongs about his ankles, while the maniac lay quivering and mumbling where it had fallen. Presently the Englishman leaped to his feet, freer than he had ever before felt in all his life though he was still hopelessly a prisoner in the blue place of seven skulls. With his back against the wall for support, so weak the reaction left him, Bradley stood watching the creature upon the floor. He saw it move and slowly raise itself to its hands and knees, where it swayed to and fro as its eyes roved about in search of him, and when at last they found him there broke from the drawn lips the mumbled words, food food there is a way out the pitiful supplication in the tones touched the englishman's heart he knew that this would be no wieroo but possibly once a man like himself who had been cast into this pit of solitary confinement with this hideous result that might in time be his fate also and then too there was the suggestion of hope held out by the constant reiteration of the phrase there is a way out. Was there a way out? What did this poor thing know? Who are you, and how long have you been here? Bradley suddenly demanded. For a moment the man upon the floor made no response. Then mumblingly came the words, Food! Food! Stop! commanded the Englishman. The injunction might have been barked from the muzzle of a pistol. It brought the man to a sitting posture, his hands off the ground. He stopped swaying to and fro, and appeared to be startled into an attempt to master his faculties of concentration and thought. Bradley repeated his question sharply. "'I am Antak, the Galu,' replied the man. "'Luata alone knows how long I have been here. Maybe ten moons, maybe ten moons three times.' It was the Caspakian equivalent of thirty. I was young and strong when they brought me here. Now I am old and very weak. I am Kos Atalu. That is why they have not killed me. If I tell them the secret of becoming Kos Atalu, they will take me out. But how can I tell them that which Luata alone knows? What is Kos Atalu? demanded Bradley. Food! Food! There is a way out! mumbled the Galu. Bradley strode across the floor, seized the man by his shoulders, and shook him. "'Tell me,' he cried, "'what is Kos Atalu? "'Food!' whimpered Antak. Bradley bethought himself. His haversack had not been taken from him. In it, besides his razor and knife, were odds and ends of equipment, and a small quantity of dried meat. He tossed a small strip of the latter to the starving Galu. Antak seized upon it and devoured it ravenously. It instilled new life in the man. "'What is Kos Atalu? insisted Bradley again. Antak tried to explain. His narrative was often broken by lapses of concentration, during which he reverted to his plaintive mumbling for food and recurrence to the statement that there was a way out but by firmness and patience the Englishman drew out piecemeal a more or less lucid exposition of the remarkable scheme of evolution that rules in Caspak. In it he found explanations of the hitherto inexplicable. He discovered why he had seen no babes or children among the Caspakian tribes with which he had come in contact, why each more northerly tribe evinced a higher state of development than those south of them, 
why each tribe included individuals ranging in physical and mental characteristics from the highest of the next lower race to the lowest of the next higher, and why the women of each tribe immersed themselves each morning for an hour or more in the warm pools near which the habitations of their people always were located and too he discovered why those pools were almost immune from the attacks of carnivorous animals and reptiles he learned that all but those who were cos came up cors vajo or from the beginning the egg from which they first developed into tadpole form was deposited with millions of others in one of the warm pools and with it a poisonous serum that the carnivora instinctively shunned down the warm stream from the pool floated the countless billions of eggs and tadpoles, developing as they drifted slowly toward the sea. Some became tadpoles in the pool, some in the sluggish stream, and some not until they reached the great inland sea. In the next stage they became fishes or reptiles. Antac was not positive which, and in this form, always developing, they swam far to the south where, amid the rank and teeming jungles, some of them evolved into amphibians. Always there were those whose development stopped at the first stage, others whose development ceased when they became reptiles, while by far the greater proportion formed the food supply of the ravenous creatures of the deep. Few indeed were those that eventually developed into baboons and then apes, which was considered by Caspakians the real beginning of evolution. From the egg, then, the individual develops slowly into a higher form, just as the frog's egg develops through various stages from a fish with gills to a frog with lungs. With that thought in mind, Bradley discovered that it was not difficult to believe in the possibility of such a scheme. There was nothing new in it. From the ape, the individual, if it survived, slowly developed into the lowest order of man, the Alu, and then by degrees to Bolu, Stolu, Bandlu, Krolu, and finally Galu. And in each stage countless millions of other eggs were deposited in the warm pools of the various races and floated down to the great sea to go through a similar process of evolution outside the womb as develops our own young within but in Caspak the scheme is much more inclusive, for it combines not only individual development, but the evolution of species and genera. If an egg survives, it goes through all the stages of development that man has passed through during the unthinkable eons since life first moved upon the earth's face. The final stage, that which the Galus have almost attained, and for which all hope, is Cos which literally means no egg man, or one who is born directly as are the young of the outer world of mammals. Some of the Galus produce Cos and Cos both, the Wirus only Cos In other words, all Wirus are born male, and so they prey upon the Galus for their women, and sometimes capture and torture the Galu men, who are Cos in an endeavor to learn the secret which they believe will give them unlimited power over all other denizens of Caspak. No Wirus come up from the beginning. All are born of the Wiru fathers and Galu mothers who are Cos and there are very few of the latter, owing to the long and precarious stages of development. Seven generations of the same ancestor must come up from the beginning before a Cos child may be born, and when one considers the frightful dangers that surround the vital spark from the moment it leaves the warm pool where it has been deposited, to float down to the sea amid the voracious creatures that swarm the surface and the deeps, and the almost equally unthinkable trials of its effort to survive after it once becomes a land animal, and starts northward through the horrors of the Caspakian jungles and forests, it is plainly a wonder that even a single babe has ever been born to a Galu woman. Seven cycles it requires before the seventh Galu can complete the seventh danger-infested circle, since its first Galu ancestor achieved the state of Galu. For ages before, the ancestors of this first Galu may have developed from a Bandlu, 
or bolu egg without ever once completing the whole circle that is from a galu egg back to a fully developed galu bradley's head was whirling before he even commenced to grasp the complexities of caspakian evolution but as the truth slowly filtered into his understanding as gradually it became possible for him to visualize the scheme it appeared simpler in fact it seemed even less difficult of comprehension than that with which he was familiar for several minutes after antak ceased speaking his voice having trailed off weakly into silence neither spoke again then the galu recommenced his food food there is a way out bradley tossed him another bit of dried meat waiting patiently until he had eaten it this time more slowly what do you mean by saying there is a way out he asked he who died here just after i came told me replied antak he said there was a way out that he had discovered it but was too weak to use his knowledge he was trying to tell me how to find it when he died oh luata if he had lived but a moment more they do not feed you here asked bradley no they give me water once a day that is all but how have you lived then the lizards and the rats replied antak the lizards are not so bad but the rats are foul to taste however i must eat them or they would eat me and they are better than nothing but of late they do not come so often and i have not had a lizard for a long time i shall eat though he mumbled i shall eat now for you cannot remain awake forever he laughed a cackling dry laugh when you sleep antak will eat it was horrible bradley shuddered for a long time each sat in silence the englishman could guess why the other made no sound he awaited the moment that sleep should overcome his victim in the long silence there was borne upon bradley's ears a faint monotonous sound as of running water he listened intently it seemed to come from far beneath the floor what is that noise he asked that sounds like water running through a narrow channel it is the river replied antak why do you not go to sleep it passes directly beneath the blue place of seven skulls it runs through the temple grounds beneath the temple and under the city when we die they will cut off our heads and throw our bodies into the river at the mouth of the river await many large reptiles thus do they feed the wieroos do likewise with their own dead keeping only the skulls and the wings come let us sleep do the reptiles come up the river into the city asked bradley the water is too cold they never leave the warm water of the great pool replied antak let us search for the way out suggested bradley antak shook his head i have searched for it all these moons he said if i could not find it how would you bradley made no reply but commenced a diligent examination of the walls and floor of the room pressing over each square foot and tapping with his knuckles about six feet from the floor he discovered a sleeping perch near one end of the apartment he asked antak about it but the galu said that no wieroo had occupied the place since he had been incarcerated there again and again bradley went over the floor and walls as high up as he could reach finally he swung himself to the perch that he might examine at least one end of the room all the way to the ceiling in the center of the wall close to the top an area about three feet square gave forth a hollow sound when he rapped upon it bradley felt over every square inch of that area with the tips of his fingers near the top he found a small round hole a trifle larger in diameter than his forefinger which he immediately stuck into it the panel if such it was seemed about an inch thick and beyond it his finger encountered nothing bradley crooked his finger upon the opposite side of the panel and pulled toward him steadily but with considerable force suddenly the panel flew inward nearly precipitating the man to the floor it was hinged at the bottom 
and when lowered the outer edge rested upon the perch, making a little platform parallel with the floor of the room. Beyond the opening was an utterly dark void. The Englishman leaned through it and reached his arm as far as possible into the blackness, but touched nothing. Then he fumbled in his haversack for a match, a few of which remained to him. When he struck it, Antak gave a cry of terror. Bradley held the light far into the opening before him, and in its flickering rays saw the top of a ladder descending into a black abyss below. How far down it extended he could not guess, but that he should soon know definitely he was positive. "'You have found it! You have found the way out!' screamed Antak. "'Oh, Luata! And now I am too weak to go! Take me with you! Take me with you!' "'Shut up!' admonished Bradley. "'You will have the whole flock of birds around our heads in a minute, and neither of us will escape. Be quiet, and I'll go ahead. If I find a way out, I'll come back and help you, if you'll promise not to try to eat me up again.' "'I promise!' cried Antak. Oh, Luata, how could you blame me? I am half crazed of hunger and long confinement, and the horror of the lizards and the rats and the constant waiting for death. I know, said Bradley simply. I'm sorry for you, old top. Keep a stiff upper lip. And he slipped through the opening, found the ladder with his feet, closed the panel behind him, and started downward into the darkness. Below him rose more and more distinctly the sound of running water. The air felt damp and cool. He could see nothing of his surroundings and felt nothing but the smooth, worn sides and rungs of the ladder, down which he felt his way cautiously, lest a broken rung or a misstep should hurl him downward. As he descended thus slowly, the ladder seemed interminable, and the pit bottomless. Yet he realized, when at last he reached the bottom, that he could not have descended more than fifty feet. The bottom of the ladder rested on a narrow ledge, paved with what felt like large round stones, but what he knew from experience to be human skulls. He could not but marvel as to where so many countless thousands of the things had come from, until he paused to consider that the infancy of Caspak dated doubtlessly back into remote ages, far beyond what the outer world considered the beginning of earthly time. For all these eons, the Wieroos might have been collecting human skulls from their enemies and their own dead, enough to have built an entire city of them. Feeling his way along the narrow ledge, Bradley came presently to a blank wall that stretched out over the water swirling beneath him as far as he could reach. Stooping, he groped about with one hand, reaching down toward the surface of the water, and discovered that the bottom of the wall arched above the stream. How much space there was between the water and the arch he could not tell, nor how deep the former. There was only one way in which he might learn these things, and that was to lure himself into the stream. For only an instant he hesitated, weighing his chances. Behind him lay almost certainly the horrid fate of Antak. Before him, nothing worse than a comparatively painless death by drowning. Holding his haversack above his head with one hand, he lowered his feet slowly over the edge of the narrow platform. Almost immediately he felt the swirling of cold water about his ankles, and then, with a silent prayer, he let himself drop gently into the stream. Great was Bradley's relief when he found the water no more than waist-deep, and beneath his feet a firm gravel bottom. Feeling his way cautiously, he moved downward with the current, which was not so strong as he had imagined from the noise of the running water. Beneath the first arch he made his way, following the winding curvatures of the right-hand wall. After a few yards of progress, his hand came suddenly in contact with a slimy thing, clinging to the wall, a thing that hissed and scuttled out of reach. What it was the man could not know, but almost instantly there was a splash in the water just ahead of him, and then another. On he went, passing beneath other arches at varying distances, and always in utter darkness. 
unseen denizens of this great sewer, disturbed by the intruder, splashed into the water ahead of him and wriggled away. Time and again his hand touched them, and never for an instant could he be sure that at the next step some gruesome thing might not attack him. He had strapped his haversack about his neck, well above the surface of the water, and in his left hand he carried his knife. Other precautions there were none to take. The monotony of the blind trail was increased by the fact that from the moment he had started from the foot of the ladder he had counted his every step. He had promised to return for Antak if it proved humanly possible to do so, and he knew that in the blackness of the tunnel he could locate the foot of the ladder in no other way. He had taken two hundred and sixty-nine steps. Afterward he knew that he should never forget that number, when something bumped gently against him from behind. Instantly he wheeled about, and with knife ready to defend himself, stretched forth his right hand to push away the object that now had lodged against his body. His fingers feeling through the darkness came in contact with something cold and clammy. They passed to and fro over the thing until Bradley knew that it was the face of a dead man floating upon the surface of the stream. With an oath he pushed his gruesome companion out into midstream to float on down toward the great pool and the awaiting scavengers of the deep. At his four hundred and thirteenth step another corpse bumped against him. How many had passed him without touching he could not guess, but suddenly he experienced the sensation of being surrounded by dead faces floating along with him, all set in hideous grimaces, their dead eyes glaring at this profaning alien who dared intrude upon the waters of this river of the dead, a horrid escort pregnant with dire forebodings and with menace. Though he advanced very slowly, he tried always to take steps of about the same length, so that he knew that though considerable time had elapsed, yet he had really advanced no more than four hundred yards, when ahead he saw a lessening of the pitch darkness, and at the next turn of the stream his surroundings became vaguely discernible. Above him was an arched roof, and on either hand walls pierced at intervals by apertures covered with wooden doors. Just ahead of him in the roof of the aqueduct was a round black hole, about thirty inches in diameter. His eyes still rested upon the opening when there shot downward from it to the water below the naked body of a human being which almost immediately rose to the surface again and floated off down the stream. In the dim light Bradley saw that it was a dead wieroo, from which the wings and the head had been removed. A moment later another headless body floated past, recalling what Antak had told him of the skull-collecting customs of the Wieroo. Bradley wondered how it happened that the first corpse he had encountered in the stream had not been similarly mutilated. The farther he advanced now, the lighter it became. The number of corpses was much smaller than he had imagined, only two more passing him before, at six hundred steps, or about five hundred yards from the point he had taken to the stream, he came to the end of the tunnel and looked out upon sunlit water running between grassy banks. One of the last corpses to pass him was still clothed in the white robe of a wieroo, blood-stained over the headless neck that it concealed. Drawing closer to the opening leading into the bright daylight, Bradley surveyed what lay beyond. A short distance before him a large building stood in the center of several acres of grass and tree-covered ground, spanning the stream which disappeared through an opening in its foundation wall. From the large saucer-shaped roof and the vivid colorings of the various heterogeneous parts of the structure, he recognized it as the temple past which he had been borne to the blue place of seven skulls. To and fro flew wieroos, going to and from the temple. Others passed on foot across the open grounds, assisting themselves with their great wings, so that they barely skimmed the earth. To leave the mouth of the tunnel would have been to court instant discovery and capture, but by what other avenue he might escape, Bradley could not guess unless he retraced his steps up the stream and sought egress from the other end of the city. 
the thought of traversing that dark and horror-ridden tunnel for perhaps miles he could not entertain there must be some other way perhaps after dark he could steal through the temple grounds and continue on downstream until he had come beyond the city and so he stood and waited until his limbs became almost paralyzed with cold and he knew that he must find some other plan for escape a half-formed decision to risk an attempt to swim under water to the temple was crystallizing in spite of the fact that any chance wieroo flying above the stream might easily see him when again a floating object bumped against him from behind and lodged across his back turning quickly he saw that the thing was what he had immediately guessed it to be a headless and wingless wieroo corpse with a grunt of disgust he was about to push it from him when the white garment enshrouding it suggested a bold plan to his resourceful brain. Grasping the corpse by an arm, he tore the garment from it, and then let the body float downward toward the temple. With great care he draped the robe about him. The bloody blotch that had covered the severed neck he arranged about his own head. His haversack he rolled as tightly as possible, and stuffed beneath his coat over his breast. Then he fell gently to the surface of the stream, and lying upon his back, floated downward with the current, and out into the open sunlight. Through the weave of the cloth he could distinguish large objects. He saw a wieroo flap dismally above him. He saw the banks of the stream float slowly past. He heard a sudden wail upon the right-hand shore, and his heart stood still, lest his ruse had been discovered but never by a move of a muscle did he betray that aught but a cold lump of clay floated there upon the bosom of the water, and soon, though it seemed an eternity to him, the direct sunlight was blotted out, and he knew that he had entered beneath the temple. Quickly he felt for bottom with his feet, and as quickly stood erect, snatching the bloody clammy cloth from his face. On both sides were blank walls, and before him the river turned a sharp corner and disappeared. Feeling his way cautiously forward, he approached the turn and looked around the corner. To his left was a low platform, about a foot above the level of the stream, and on to this he lost no time in climbing, for he was soaked from head to foot, cold and almost exhausted. As he lay resting on the skull-paved shelf, he saw in the center of the vault above the river another of those sinister round holes through which he momentarily expected to see a headless corpse shoot downward in its last plunge to a watery grave. A few feet along the platform a closed door broke the blankness of the wall. As he lay looking at it and wondering what lay behind, his mind filled with fragments of many wild schemes of escape it opened, and a white-robed wieroo stepped out upon the platform. The creature carried a large wooden basin filled with rubbish. Its eyes were not upon Bradley, who drew himself to a squatting position, and crouched as far back in the corner of the niche in which the platform was set as he could force himself. The wieroo stepped to the edge of the platform and dumped the rubbish into the stream. If it turned away from him as it started to retrace its steps to the doorway, there was a small chance that it might not see him, but if it turned toward him there was none at all. Bradley held his breath. The wieroo paused a moment, gazing down into the water, then it straightened up and turned toward the Englishman. Bradley did not move. The wieroo stopped and stared intently at him. It approached him questioningly. Still Bradley remained as though carved of stone. The creature was directly in front of him. It stopped. There was no chance on earth that it would not discover what he was. With the quickness of a cat, Bradley sprang to his feet and with all his strength backed by his heavy weight struck the wieroo upon the point of the chin. Without a sound, the thing crumpled to the platform, while Bradley, acting almost instinctively to the urge of the first law of nature, rolled the inanimate body over the edge into the river. Then he looked at the open doorway, crossed the platform, and peered within the apartment beyond. What he saw was a large room, dimly lighted, and about the side rows of wooden vessels stacked one upon another. There was no wieroo in sight, so the Englishman entered. At the far end of the room was another door. 
and as he crossed toward it he glanced into some of the vessels which he found were filled with dried fruits, vegetables, and fish. Without more ado he stuffed his pockets and his haversack full, thinking of the poor creature awaiting his return in the gloom of the place of seven skulls. When night came he would return and fetch Antak this far at least, but in the meantime it was his intention to reconnoiter in the hope that he might discover some easier way out of the city than that offered by the chill black channel of the ghastly river of corpses. Beyond the farther door stretched a long passageway, from which closed doorways led into other parts of the cellars of the temple. A few yards from the storeroom a ladder rose from the corridor through an aperture in the ceiling. Bradley paused at the foot of it, debating the wisdom of further investigation against a return to the river, but strong within him was the spirit of exploration that had scattered his race to the four corners of the earth. What new mysteries lay hidden in the chambers above? The urge to know was strong upon him, though his better judgment warned him that the safer course lay in retreat. For a moment he stood thus, running his fingers through his hair. Then he cast discretion to the winds and began the ascent. In conformity with such Wieroo architecture as he had already observed, the well through which the ladder rose continually canted at an angle from the perpendicular. At more or less regular stages it was pierced by apertures closed by doors, none of which he could open until he had climbed fully fifty feet from the river level. Here he discovered a door already ajar, opening into a large circular chamber, the walls and floors of which were covered with the skins of wild beasts and with rugs of many colors. But what interested him most was the occupants of the room, a wieroo, and a girl of human proportions. She was standing with her back against a column which rose from the center of the apartment from floor to ceiling, a hollow column about forty inches in diameter in which he could see an opening some thirty inches across. The girl's side was toward Bradley, and her face averted, for she was watching the Wieroo, who was now advancing slowly toward her, talking as he came. Bradley could distinctly hear the words of the creature, who was urging the girl to accompany him to another Wieroo city. "'Come with me,' he said, "'and you shall have your life. Remain here, and he who speaks for Luata will claim you for his own, and when he is done with you, your skull will bleach at the top of a tall staff, while your body feeds the reptiles at the mouth of the river of death. Even though you bring into the world a female Wieroo, your fate will be the same if you do not escape him.' while with me you shall have life and food, and none shall harm you. He was quite close to the girl when she replied by striking him in the face with all her strength. Until I am slain, she cried, I shall fight against you all. From the throat of the Wieroo issued that dismal wail that Bradley had heard so often in the past, it was like a scream of pain smothered to a groan, and then the thing leaped upon the girl, its face working in hideous grimaces as it clawed and beat at her to force her to the floor. The Englishman was upon the point of entering to defend her when a door at the opposite side of the chamber opened to admit a huge Wieroo clothed entirely in red. At sight of the two struggling upon the floor, the newcomer raised his voice in a shriek of rage. Instantly the Wieroo, who was attacking the girl, leaped to his feet and faced the other. "'I heard!' screamed he who had just entered the room. "'I heard! And when he who speaks for Luata shall have heard!' He paused and made a suggestive movement of a finger across his throat. "'He shall not hear!' returned the first Wieroo, as, with a powerful motion of his great wings, he launched himself upon the red-robed figure. The latter dodged the first charge, drew a wicked-looking curved blade from beneath its red robe, spread its wings and dived for its antagonist. Beating their wings, wailing and groaning, the two hideous things sparred for position. The white-robed one, being unarmed, sought to grasp the other by the wrist of its knife-hand and by the throat, while the latter hopped around on its dainty white feet, seeking an opening for a mortal blow. Once it struck and missed, and then the other rushed in and clinched, at the same time securing both the holds it sought. 
Immediately the two commenced beating at each other's heads with the joints of their wings, kicking with their soft, puny feet, and biting each at the other's face. In the meantime the girl moved about the room, keeping out of the way of the duelists, and as she did so Bradley caught a glimpse of her full face and immediately recognized her as the girl of the place of the yellow door. He did not dare intervene now until one of the Wieroo had overcome the other, lest the two should turn upon him at once, when the chances were fair that he would be defeated in so unequal a battle as the curved blade of the red Wieroo would render it, and so he waited, watching the white-robed figure slowly choking the life from him of the red robe. The protruding tongue and the popping eyes proclaimed that the end was near, and a moment later the red robe sank to the floor of the room, the curved blade slipping from the nerveless fingers. For an instant longer the victor clung to the throat of his defeated antagonist, and then he rose, dragging the body after him, and approached the central column. Here he raised the body and thrust it into the aperture, where Bradley saw it drop suddenly from sight. Instantly there flashed into his memory the circular openings in the roof of the river vault and the corpses he had seen drop from them to the water beneath. As the body disappeared, the Wieroo turned and cast about the room for the girl. For a moment he stood eyeing her. "'You saw,' he muttered, "'and if you tell them, he who speaks for Luata will have my wings severed while still I live, and my head will be severed, and I shall be cast into the river of death, for thus it happens even to the highest who slay one of the red robe. You saw, and you must die. He ended with a scream as he rushed upon the girl. Bradley waited no longer. Leaping into the room he ran for the Wieroo, who had already seized the girl, and as he ran he stooped and picked up the curved blade. The creature's back was toward him, as with his left hand he seized it by the neck. Like a flash the great wings beat backward as the creature turned, and Bradley was swept from his feet, though he still retained his hold upon the blade. Instantly the Wieroo was upon him. Bradley lay slightly raised upon his left elbow, his right arm free, and as the thing came close he cut at the hideous face with all the strength that lay within him. The blade struck at the junction of the neck and torso, and with such force as to completely decapitate the Wieroo, the hideous head dropping to the floor and the body falling forward upon the Englishman. Pushing it from him, he rose to his feet and faced the wide-eyed girl. Luata, she exclaimed, how came you here? Bradley shrugged. Here I am, he said, but the thing now is to get out of here, both of us. The girl shook her head. It cannot be, she stated sadly. That is what I thought when they dropped me into the blue place of seven skulls, replied Bradley. Can't be done. I did it. Here, you're mussing up the floor something awful, you. This last to the dead Wieroo, as he stooped and dragged the corpse to the central shaft, where he raised it to the aperture and let it slip into the tube. Then he picked up the head and tossed it after the body. Don't be so glum, he admonished the former as he carried it toward the well. Smile. But how can he smile? questioned the girl, a half-puzzled, half-frightened look upon her face. He is dead. That's so, admitted Bradley, and I suppose he does feel a bit cut up about it. The girl shook her head and edged away from the man toward the door. Come, said the Englishman, we've got to get out of here. If you don't know a better way than the river, it's the river, then. The girl still eyed him askance. But how could he smile when he was dead? Bradley laughed aloud. I thought we English were supposed to have the least sense of humor of any people in the world, he cried. But now I've found one human being who hasn't any. Of course, you don't know half I'm saying. But don't worry, little girl. I'm not going to hurt you. And if I can get you out of here, I'll do it. Even if she did not understand all he said, she at least read something in his smiling countenance, something which reassured her. "'I do not fear you,' she said, "'though I do not understand all that you say, even though you speak my own tongue, and use words that I know. But as for escaping,' she sighed, "'alas, how can it be done?' "'I escaped from the blue place of seven skulls,' Bradley reminded her. "'Come!' 
and he turned toward the shaft and the ladder that he had ascended from the river. We cannot waste time here. The girl followed him, but at the doorway both drew back, for from below came the sound of someone ascending. Bradley tiptoed to the door and peered cautiously into the well. Then he stepped back beside the girl. There are half a dozen of them coming up, but possibly they will pass this room. No, she said, they will pass directly through this room. They are on their way to him who speaks for Luata. We may be able to hide in the next room. There are skins there beneath which we may crawl. They will not stop in that room, but they may stop in this one for a short time. The other room is blue. What's that got to do with it? demanded the Englishman. They fear blue, she replied. In every room where murder has been done, you will find blue, a certain amount for each murder. When the room is all blue, they shun it. This room has much blue, but evidently they kill mostly in the next room, which is now all blue. But there is blue on the outside of every house I've seen, said Bradley. Yes, assented the girl, and there are blue rooms in each of those houses. When all the rooms are blue, then the whole outside of the house will be blue, as is the blue place of seven skulls. There are many such here. And the skulls with blue upon them, inquired Bradley, did they belong to murderers? They were murdered, some of them. Those with only a small amount of blue were murderers, known murderers. All Wieroos are murderers. When they have committed a certain number of murders without being caught at it, they confess to him who speaks for Luata, and are advanced, after which they wear robes with a slash of some color. I think yellow comes first. When they reach a point where the entire robe is of yellow, they discard it for a white robe with a red slash, and when one wins a complete red robe, he carries such a long curved knife as you have in your hand. After that comes the blue slash on a white robe, and then, I suppose, an all-blue robe. I have never seen such an one. As they talked in low tones, they had moved from the room of the death shaft into an all-blue room adjoining, where they sat down together in a corner with their backs against a wall, and drew a pile of hides over themselves. A moment later they heard a number of wieroos enter the chamber. They were talking together as they crossed the floor, or the two could not have heard them. Halfway across the chamber they halted as the door toward which they were advancing opened, and a dozen others of their kind entered the apartment. Bradley could guess all this by the increased volume of sound and the dismal greetings, but the sudden silence that almost immediately ensued he could not fathom, for he could not know that from beneath one of the hides that covered him protruded one of his heavy army shoes, or that some eighteen large wieroos with robes either solid red or slashed with red or blue were standing gazing at it, nor could he hear their stealthy approach. The first intimation he had that he had been discovered was when his foot was suddenly seized, and he was yanked violently from beneath the hides to find himself surrounded by menacing blades. They would have slain him on the spot had not one clothed all in red held them back, saying that he who speaks for Luata desired to see this strange creature. As they led Bradley away, he caught an opportunity to glance back toward the hides to see what had become of the girl, and to his gratification he discovered that she still lay concealed beneath the hides. He wondered if she would have the nerve to attempt the river trip alone, and regretted that now he could not accompany her. He felt rather all in himself more so than he had at any time since he had been captured by the Wieroo, for there appeared not the slightest cause for hope in his present predicament. He had dropped the curved blade beneath the hides when he had been jerked so violently from their fancied security. It was almost in a spirit of resigned hopelessness that he quietly accompanied his captors through various chambers and corridors toward the heart of the temple. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Out of Time's Abyss. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Ralph Snelson. Out of Time's Abyss by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 4 The farther the group progressed, the more barbaric and the more sumptuous became the decorations. Hides of leopard and tiger predominated, apparently because of their more beautiful markings, and decorative skulls became more and more numerous. Many of the latter were mounted in precious metals and set with colored stones and priceless gems, while thick upon the hides that covered the walls were golden ornaments similar to those worn by the girl and those which had filled the chests he had examined in the storeroom of Foch Balsage. Leading the Englishman to the conviction that all such were spoils of war or theft, since each piece seemed made for personal adornment, while in so far as he had seen, no Wieroo wore ornaments of any sort. And also, as they advanced, the more numerous became the Wieroos moving hither and thither within the temple. Many now were the solid red robes, and those that were slashed with blue, a veritable hive of murderers. At last the party halted in a room in which were many Wieroos who gathered about Bradley, questioning his captors and examining him and his apparel. One of the party accompanying the Englishman spoke to a Wieroo that stood beside a door leading from the room. "'Tell him who speaks for Luata,' he said, "'that Fosh Balzaj we could not find. But in returning we found this creature within the temple, hiding. It must be the same that Fosh Balzaj captured in the Stolu country during the last darkness. Doubtless he who speaks for Luata would wish to see and question this strange thing.' The creature addressed turned and slipped through the doorway, closing the door after it, but first depositing its curved blade upon the floor without. Its post was immediately taken by another, and Bradley now saw that at least twenty such guards loitered in the immediate vicinity. The doorkeeper was gone but for a moment, and when he returned he signified that Bradley's party was to enter the next chamber but first each of the Wieroos removed his curved weapon and laid it upon the floor. The door was swung open, and the party, now reduced to Bradley and five Wieroos, was ushered across the threshold into a large, irregularly shaped room, in which a single giant Wieroo, whose robe was solid blue, sat upon a raised dais. The creature's face was white with the whiteness of a corpse, its dead eyes entirely expressionless, its cruel thin lips tight drawn against yellow teeth in a perpetual grimace. Upon either side of it lay an enormous curved sword, similar to those with which some of the other Wieroos had been armed, but larger and heavier. Constantly its claw-like fingers played with one or the other of these weapons. The walls of the chamber, as well as the floor, were entirely hidden by skins and woven fabrics. Blue predominated in all the colorations, Fastened against the hides were many pairs of Wieroo wings, mounted so that they resembled long black shields. Upon the ceiling were painted in blue characters a bewildering series of hieroglyphics, and upon pedestals set against the walls or standing out well within the room were many human skulls. As the Wieroos approached the figure upon the dais, they leaned far forward, raising their wings above their heads, and stretching their necks as though offering them to the sharp swords of the grim and hideous creature. "'O oh, thou who speakest for Luata!' exclaimed one of the party. "'We bring you the strange creature that Fosh Balsaj captured, and brought thither at thy command.' So this, then, was the godlike figure that spoke for divinity. This arch-murderer was the Caspakian representative of God on earth. His blue robe announced him the one, and the seeming humility of his minions the other. For a long minute he glared at Bradley. Then he began to question him. From whence he came, and how, the name and description of his native country, and a hundred other queries. "'Are you cos the creature asked. Bradley replied that he was, and that all his kind were, as well as every living thing in his part of the world. "'Can you tell me the secret?' asked the creature. Bradley hesitated, and then, thinking to gain time, replied in the affirmative. "'What is it?' demanded the Wieroo, leaning far forward, and exhibiting every evidence of excited interest. Bradley leaned forward and whispered, "'It is for your ears alone. I will not divulge it to others. 
and then only on condition that you carry me and the girl I saw in the place of the yellow door near to that of Foss Balsage back to her own country. The thing rose in wrath, holding one of its swords above its head. Who are you to make terms for him who speaks for Luata? It shrilled. Tell me the secret, or die where you stand. And if I die now, the secret goes with me, Bradley reminded him. Never again will you get the opportunity to question another of my kind who knows the secret. Anything to gain time, to get the rest of the Wieroos from the room, that he might plan some scheme for escape and put it into effect. The creature turned upon the leader of the party that had brought Bradley. Is the thing with weapons? it asked. No, was the response. Then go, but tell the guard to remain close by, commanded the high one. The Wieroos salaamed and withdrew, closing the door behind them. He who speaks for Luata grasped a sword nervously in his right hand. At his left side lay the second weapon. It was evident that he lived in constant dread of being assassinated. The fact that he permitted none with weapons within his presence, and that he always kept two swords at his side, pointed to this. Bradley was racking his brain to find some suggestion of a plan whereby he might turn the situation to his own account. His eyes wandered past the weird figure before him. They played about the walls of the apartment as though hoping to draw inspiration from the dead skulls and the hides and the wings, and then they came back to the face of the Wieroo god, now working in anger. "'Quick!' screamed the thing. "'The secret!' "'Will you give me and the girl our freedom?' insisted Bradley. For an instant the thing hesitated, and then it grumbled, Yes. At the same instant Bradley saw two hides upon the wall directly back of the dais separate and a face appear in the opening. No change of expression upon the Englishman's countenance betrayed that he had seen aught to surprise him, though surprised he was, for the face in the aperture was that of the girl he had but just left, hidden beneath the hides in another chamber. A white and shapely arm now pushed past the face into the room, and in the hand tightly clutched was the curved blade, smeared with blood, that Bradley had dropped beneath the hides at the moment he had been discovered and drawn from his concealment. "'Listen, then,' said Bradley in a low voice to the Wieroo. "'You shall know the secret of Kos Atalu as well as do I, but none other may hear it. Lean close. I will whisper it into your ear.' He moved forward and stepped upon the dais. The creature raised its sword, ready to strike at the first indication of treachery, and Bradley stooped beneath the blade and put his ear close to the gruesome face. As he did so, he rested his weight upon his hands, one upon either side of the Wieroo's body, his right hand upon the hilt of the spare sword lying at the left of him who speaks for Luata. This, then, is the secret of both life and death, he whispered and at the same instant he grasped the Wieroo by the right wrist, and with his own right hand swung the extra blade in a sudden vicious blow against the creature's neck before the thing could give even a single cry of alarm. Then, without waiting an instant, Bradley leaped past the dead god and vanished behind the hides that had hidden the girl. Wide-eyed and panting, the girl seized his arm. "'Oh, what have you done?' she cried. "'He who speaks for Luata will be avenged by Luata.' now indeed must you die there is no escape for even though we reached my own country luata can find you out bosh exclaimed bradley and then but you were going to knife him yourself then i alone should have died she replied bradley scratched his head neither of us is going to die he said at least not at the hands of any god if we don't get out of here though we'll die right enough can you find your way back to the room where I first came upon you in the temple? I know the way, replied the girl, but I doubt if we can go back without being seen. I came hither because I only met Wieroos who knew that I am supposed now to be in the temple, but you could go elsewhere without being discovered. Bradley's ingenuity had come up against a stone wall. There seemed no possibility of escape. He looked about him. They were in a small room where lay a litter of rubbish, torn bits of cloth, old hides, pieces of fiber rope. In the center of the room was a cylindrical shaft with an opening in its face. Bradley knew it for what it was. 
Here the arch-fiend dragged his victims and cast their bodies into the river of death far below. The floor about the opening in the shaft and the sides of the shaft were clotted thick with a dry, dark brown substance that the Englishman knew had once been blood. The place had the appearance of having been a veritable shambles. An odor of decaying flesh permeated the air. The Englishman crossed to the shaft and peered into the opening. All below was dark as pitch, but at the bottom he knew was the river. Suddenly an inspiration and a bold scheme leaped to his mind. Turning quickly, he hunted about the room until he found what he sought, a quantity of the rope that lay strewn here and there. With rapid fingers he unsnarled the different lengths, the girl helping him, and then he tied the ends together until he had three ropes about seventy-five feet in length. He fastened these together at each end, and without a word secured one of the ends about the girl's body beneath her arms. "'Don't be frightened,' he said at length, as he led her toward the opening in the shaft. "'I'm going to lower you to the river, and then I'm coming down after you. When you are safe below, give two quick jerks upon the rope. If there is danger there, and you want me to draw you up into the shaft, jerk once. Don't be afraid. It is the only way.' "'I am not afraid.' replied the girl, rather haughtily, Bradley thought, and herself climbed through the aperture and hung by her hands, waiting for Bradley to lower her. As rapidly as was consistent with safety, the man paid out the rope. When it was about half out, he heard loud cries and wails suddenly arise within the room they had just quitted. The slaying of their god had been discovered by the Wieroos. A search for the slayer would begin at once. Lord, would the girl never reach the river? At last, just as he was positive that searchers were already entering the room behind him, there came two quick tugs at the rope. Instantly Bradley made the rest of the strands fast about the shaft, slipped into the black tube, and began a hurried descent toward the river. An instant later he stood waist-deep in water beside the girl. Impulsively she reached toward him and grasped his arm. A strange thrill ran through him at the contact but he only cut the rope from about her body and lifted her to the little shelf at the river's side. "'How can we leave here?' she asked. "'By the river,' he replied. "'But first I must go back to the blue place of Seven Skulls and get the poor devil I left there. I'll have to wait until after dark, though, as I cannot pass through the open stretch of river in the temple gardens by day.' "'There is another way,' said the girl. "'I have never seen it, but often I have heard them speak of it a corridor that runs beside the river from one end of the city to the other. Through the gardens it is below ground. If we could find an entrance to it, we could leave here at once. It is not safe here, for they will search every inch of the temple and the grounds. Come, said Bradley, we'll have a look for it anyway. And so saying, he approached one of the doors that opened onto the skull-paved shelf. They found the corridor easily, for it paralleled the river, separated from it only by a single wall. It took them beneath the gardens and the city, always through inky darkness. After they had reached the other side of the gardens, Bradley counted his steps until he had retraced as many as he had taken coming down the stream, but though they had to grope their way along, it was a much more rapid trip than the former. When he thought he was about opposite the point at which he had descended from the blue place of seven skulls, he sought and found a doorway leading out onto the river, and then, still in the blackest darkness, he lowered himself into the stream and felt up and down upon the opposite side for the little shelf and the ladder. Ten yards from where he had emerged he found them, while the girl waited upon the opposite side. To ascend the secret panel was the work of but a minute, here he paused and listened, lest a Wieroo might be visiting the prison in search of him or the other inmate. But no sound came from the gloomy interior. Bradley could not but muse upon the joy of the man on the opposite side when he should drop down to him with food and a new hope for escape. Then he opened the panel and looked into the room. The faint light from the grating above revealed the pile of rags in one corner but the man lay beneath them. He made no response to Bradley's low greeting. The Englishman lowered himself to the floor of the room and approached the rags. Stooping, he lifted a corner of them. Yes, there was the man asleep. Bradley shook him. There was no response. He stooped lower, 
and in the dim light examined Antak. Then he stood up with a sigh. A rat leaped from beneath the coverings and scurried away. Poor devil, muttered Bradley. He crossed the room to swing himself to the perch preparatory to quitting the blue place of seven skulls forever. Beneath the perch he paused. I'll not give them the satisfaction, he growled. Let them believe that he escaped. Returning to the pile of rags, he gathered the man into his arms. It was difficult work, raising him to the high perch and dragging him through the small opening and thus down the ladder. But presently it was done, and Bradley had lowered the body into the river and cast it off. Goodbye, old top, he whispered. A moment later he had rejoined the girl, and hand in hand they were following the dark corridor upstream toward the farther end of the city. She told him that the Wieroos seldom frequented these lower passages, as the air here was too chill for them. But occasionally they came, and as they could see quite as well by night as by day, they would be sure to discover Bradley and the girl. "'If they come close enough,' she said, "'we can see their eyes shining in the dark. They resemble dull splotches of light. They glow, but do not blaze like the eyes of the tiger or the lion.' The man could not but note the very evident horror with which she mentioned the creatures. To him they were uncanny, but she had been used to them for a year almost, and probably all her life she had either seen or heard of them constantly. "'Why do you fear them so?' he asked. "'It seems more than an ordinary fear of the harm they can do you.' She tried to explain, but the nearest he could gather was that she looked upon the Wieroo almost as supernatural beings. There is a legend current among my people that once the Wieroo were unlike us only in that they possessed rudimentary wings. They lived in villages in the Galu country, and while the two peoples often warred, they held no hatred for one another. In those days each race came up from the beginning, and there was great rivalry as to which was the higher in the scale of evolution. The Wieroo developed the first cos but they were always male never could they reproduce woman. Slowly they commenced to develop certain attributes of the mind which they considered placed them upon a still higher level, and which gave them many advantages over us. Seeing which they thought only of mental development, their minds became like stars and the rivers, moving always in the same manner, never varying. They called this tasad, which means doing everything the right way, or, in other words, the Wieroo way. If foe or friend, right or wrong, stood in the way of Tassad, then it must be crushed. Soon the Galus and the lesser races of men came to hate and fear them. It was then that the Wieroos decided to carry Tassad into every part of the world. They were very warlike and very numerous, although they had long since adopted the policy of slaying all those among them whose wings did not show advanced development. It took ages for all this to happen. Very slowly came the different changes, but at last the Wieroos had wings they could use. But by reason of always making war upon their neighbors, they were hated by every creature of Caspak, for no one wanted their Tassad, and so they used their wings to fly to this island when the other races turned against them and threatened to kill them all. So cruel had they become, and so bloodthirsty, that they no longer had hearts that beat with love or sympathy. But their very cruelty and wickedness kept them from conquering the other races, since they were also cruel and wicked to one another, so that no Wieroo trusted another. Always were they slaying those above them that they might rise in power and possessions, until at last came the more powerful than the others, with a tassad all his own. He gathered about him a few of the most terrible Wieroos, and among them they made laws which took from all but these few Wieroos every weapon they possessed. Now their Tassad has reached a high plain among them. They make many wonderful things that we cannot make. They think great thoughts, no doubt, and still dream of greatness to come, but their thoughts and their acts are regulated by ages of custom. They are all alike, and they are most unhappy. As the girl talked, the two moved steadily along the dark passageway beside the river. They had advanced a considerable distance when there sounded faintly from far ahead the muffled roar of falling water, which increased in volume as they moved forward until at last it filled the corridor with a deafening sound. 
Then the corridor ended in a blank wall, but in a niche to the right was a ladder leading aloft, and to the left was a door opening on to the river. Bradley tried the ladder first, and as he opened it felt a heavy spray against his face. The little shelf outside the doorway was wet and slippery, the roaring of the water tremendous. There could be but one explanation. They had reached a waterfall in the river, and if the corridor actually terminated here, their escape was effectually cut off, since it was quite evidently impossible to follow the bed of the river and ascend the falls. As the latter was the only alternative, the two turned toward it, and the man first began the ascent, which was through a well similar to that which had led him to the upper floors of the temple. As he climbed, Bradley felt for openings in the side of the shaft, but he discovered none below fifty feet. The first he came to was ajar, letting a faint light into the well. As he paused, the girl climbed to his side, and together they looked through the crack into a low-sealed chamber in which were several Galu women and an equal number of hideous little replicas of the full-grown Wieroos with which Bradley was not quite familiar. He could feel the body of the girl pressed close to his tremble as her eyes rested upon the inmates of the room, and involuntarily his arm encircled her shoulders as though to protect her from some danger which he sensed without recognizing. "'Poor things,' she whispered. "'This is their horrible fate, to be imprisoned here beneath the surface of the city with their hideous offspring whom they hate as they hate their fathers.' A Wieroo keeps his children thus hidden until they are full grown, lest they be murdered by their fellows. The lower rooms of the city are filled with many such as these. Several feet above was a second door beyond which they found a small room stored with food in wooden vessels. A grated window in one wall opened above an alley, and through it they could see that they were just below the roof of the building. Darkness was coming and at Bradley's suggestion they decided to remain hidden here until after dark, and then to ascend to the roof and reconnoiter. Shortly after they had settled themselves, they heard something descending the ladder from above. They hoped that it would continue on down the well, and fairly held their breath as the sound approached the door to the storeroom. Their hearts sank as they heard the door open, and from between cracks in the vessels behind which they hid saw a yellow-slashed Wieroo enter the room. Each recognized him immediately, the girl indicating the fact of her own recognition by a sudden pressure of her fingers on Bradley's arm. It was the Wieroo of the yellow slashing whose abode was the place of the yellow door in which Bradley had first seen the girl. The creature carried a wooden bowl which it filled with dried food from several of the vessels. Then it turned and quit the room. Bradley could see through the partially open doorway that it descended the ladder. The girl told him that it was taking the food to the women and the young below, and that while it might return immediately, the chances were that it would remain for some time. "'We are just below the place of the yellow door,' she said. "'It is far from the edge of the city.' so far that we may not hope to escape if we ascend to the roofs here. I think, replied the man, that of all the places in Uo, this will be the easiest to escape from. Anyway, I want to return to the place of the yellow door and get my pistol, if it is there. It is still there, replied the girl. I saw it placed in a chest where he keeps the things he takes from his prisoners and victims. Good, explained Bradley. Now come quickly, and the two crossed the room to the well and ascended the ladder a short distance to its top, where they found another door that opened into a vacant room, the same in which Bradley had first met the girl. To find the pistol was a matter of but a moment's search on the part of Bradley's companion, and then at the Englishman's signal she followed him to the yellow door. It was quite dark without as the two entered the narrow passage between two buildings, a few steps brought them undiscovered to the doorway of the storeroom where lay the body of Fosh Balsage. In the distance, toward the temple, they could hear sounds as of a great gathering of Wieroos, the peculiar, uncanny wailing rising above the dismal flapping of countless wings. "'They have heard of the killing of him who speaks for Luata,' whispered the girl. "'Soon they will spread in all directions, searching for us.' 
"'And will they find us?' "'As surely as Lua gives light by day,' she replied, "'and when they find us they will tear us to pieces, "'for only the Wieroos may murder, "'only they may practice Tassad. "'But they will not kill you,' said Bradley. "'You did not slay him.' "'It will make no difference,' she insisted. "'If they find us together they will slay us both.' then they won't find us together announced bradley decisively you stay right here you won't be any worse off than before i came and i'll get as far as i can and account for as many of the beggars as possible before they get me good-bye you're a mighty decent little girl i wish that i might have helped you no she cried do not leave me i would rather die i had hoped and hoped to find some way to return to my own country I wanted to go back to Antak, who must be very lonely without me, but I know that it never can be. It is difficult to kill hope, though mine is nearly dead. Do not leave me. Antak, Bradley repeated. You loved a man called Antak? Yes, replied the girl. Antak was away hunting when the Wieroo caught me. How he must have grieved for me. He also was cos twelve moons older than I and all our lives we have been together bradley remained silent so she loved antak he hadn't the heart to tell her that antak had died or how at the door of fosh balsage storeroom they halted to listen no sound came from within and gently bradley pushed open the door all was inky darkness as they entered but presently their eyes became accustomed to the gloom that was partially relieved by the soft starlight without. The Englishman searched and found those things for which he had come, two robes, two pairs of dead wings, and several lengths of fiber rope. One pair of the wings he adjusted to the girl's shoulders by means of the rope. Then he draped the robe about her, carrying the cowl over her head. He heard her gasp of astonishment when she realized the ingenuity and boldness of his plan. Then he directed her to adjust the other pair of wings and the robe upon him. Working with strong, deft fingers, she soon had the work completed, and the two stepped out upon the roof, to all intent and purpose, genuine Wieroos. Beside his pistol, Bradley carried the sword of the slain Wieroo prophet, while the girl was armed with the small blade of the red Wieroo. Side by side they walked slowly across the roofs toward the north edge of the city. Wieroos flapped above them, and several times they passed others walking or sitting upon the roofs. From the temple still rose the sounds of commotion, now pierced by occasional shrill screams. "'The murderers are abroad,' whispered the girl. "'Thus will another become the tongue of Luata. It is well for us, since it keeps them too busy to give the time for searching for us.' They think that we cannot escape the city, and they know that we cannot leave the island, and so do I. Bradley shook his head. If there is any way, we will find it, he said. There is no way, replied the girl. Bradley made no response, and in silence they continued, until the outer edge of roofs was visible before them. We are almost there, he whispered. The girl felt for his fingers and pressed them. He could feel hers trembling as he returned the pressure, nor did he relinquish her hand, and thus they came to the edge of the last roof. Here they halted and looked about them. To be seen attempting to descend to the ground below would be to betray the fact that they were not Wieroos. Bradley wished that their wings were attached to their bodies by sinew and muscle rather than by ropes of fiber. A Wieroo was flapping far overhead. Two more stood near a door a few yards distant. Standing between these and one of the outer pedestals that supported one of the numerous skulls, Bradley made one end of a piece of rope fast about the pedestal and dropped the other end to the ground outside the city. Then they waited. It was an hour before the coast was entirely clear, and then a moment came when no Wieroo was in sight. Now, whispered Bradley, and the girl grasped the rope and slid over the edge of the roof into the darkness below. A moment later Bradley felt two quick pulls upon the rope and immediately followed to the girl's side. Across a narrow clearing they made their way and into a wood beyond. All night they walked, following the river upward toward its source, and at dawn they took shelter in a thicket beside the stream. 
at no time did they hear the cry of a carnivore and though many startled animals fled as they approached they were not once menaced by a wild beast when bradley expressed surprise at the absence of the fiercest beasts that are so numerous upon the mainland of caprona the girl explained the reason that is contained in one of their ancient legends when the rearus first developed wings upon which they could fly they found this island devoid of any life other than a few reptiles that live either upon land or in the water and these only close to the coast requiring meat for food the wieroos carried to the island such animals as they wished for that purpose they still occasionally bring them and this with the natural increase keeps them provided with flesh as it will us suggested bradley the first day they remained in hiding eating only the dried food that bradley had brought with him from the temple storeroom and the next night they set out again upon the river continuing steadily on until almost dawn when they came to low hills where the river wound through a gorge it was little more than rivulet now the water clear and cold and filled with fish similar to brook trout though much larger not wishing to leave the stream the two waded along its bed to a spot where the gorge widened between perpendicular bluffs to a wooded acre of level land here they stopped for here also the stream ended they had reached its source many cold springs bubbling up from the center of a little natural amphitheater in the hills and forming a clear and beautiful pool overshadowed by trees upon one side and bounded by a little clearing upon the other with the coming of the sun they saw they had stumbled upon a place where they might remain hidden from the wieroos for a long time and also one that they could defend against these winged creatures since the trees would shield them from an attack from above and also hamper the movements of the creatures should they attempt to follow them into the wood for three days they rested here before trying to explore the neighboring country on the fourth bradley stated that he was going to scale the bluffs and learn what lay beyond he told the girl that she should remain in hiding but she refused to be left saying that whatever fate was to be his she intended to share it so that he was at last forced to permit her to come with him through woods at the summit of the bluff they made their way toward the north and had gone but a short distance when the wood ended and before them they saw the waters of the inland sea and dimly in the distance the coveted shore the beach lay some two hundred yards from the foot of the hill on which they stood nor was there a tree nor any other form of shelter between them and the water as far up and down the coast as they could see among other plans bradley had thought of constructing a covered raft upon which they might drift to the mainland but as such a contrivance would necessarily be of considerable weight it must be built in the water of the sea since they could not hope to move it even a short distance overland if this wood was only at the edge of the water he sighed but it is not the girl reminded him and then let us make the best of it we have escaped from death for a time at least we have food and good water and peace and each other what more could we have upon the mainland but i thought you wanted to get back to your own country he exclaimed she cast her eyes upon the ground and half turned away i do she said yet i am happy here i could be little happier there bradley stood in silent thought we have food and good water and peace and each other he repeated to himself he turned then and looked at the girl and it was as though in the days that they had been together this was the first time that he had really seen her the circumstances that had thrown them together the dangers through which they had passed all the weird and horrible surroundings that had formed the background of his knowledge of her had had their effect she had been but the companion of an adventure her self-reliance her endurance her loyalty had been only what one man might expect of another and he saw that he had unconsciously assumed an attitude toward her that he might have assumed toward a man yet there had been a difference he recalled now the strange sensation of elation 
that had thrilled him upon the occasions when the girl had pressed his hand in hers, and the depression that had followed her announcement of her love for Antak. He took a step toward her. A fierce yearning to seize her and crush her in his arms swept over him, and then there flashed upon the screen of recollection the picture of a stately hall set amidst broad gardens and ancient trees, and of a proud old man with beetling brows, an old man who held his head very high, and Bradley shook his head and turned away again. They went back then to their little acre, and the days came and went, and the man fashioned spear and bow and arrows, and hunted with them, that they might have meat, and he made hooks of fish bone, and caught fishes with wondrous flies of his own invention, and the girl gathered fruits, and cooked the flesh and the fish, and made beds of branches and soft grasses. She cured the hides of the animals he killed, and made them soft by much pounding. She made sandals for herself and for the man, and fashioned a hide after the manner of those worn by the warriors of her tribe, and made the man wear it, for his own garments were in rags. She was always the same, sweet and kind and helpful, but always there was about her manner and her expression just a trace of wistfulness, and often she sat and looked at the man when he did not know it, her brows puckered in thought, as though she were trying to fathom and to understand him. In the face of the cliff Bradley scooped a cave from the rotted granite of which the hill was composed, making a shelter for them against the rains. He brought wood for their cook-fire, which they used only in the middle of the day, a time when there was little likelihood of Wieroos being in the air so far from their city, and then he learned to bank it with earth in such a way that the embers held until the following noon without giving off smoke. Always he was planning on reaching the mainland, and never a day passed that he did not go to the top of the hill and look out across the sea toward the dark, distant line that meant for him comparative freedom and possibly reunion with his comrades. The girl always went with him, standing at his side and watching the stern expression on his face with just a tinge of sadness on her own. "'You are not happy,' she said once. I should be over there with my men, he replied. I do not know what may have happened to them. I want you to be happy, she said quite simply, but I should be very lonely if you went away and left me here. He put his hand on her shoulder. I would not do that, little girl, he said gently. If you cannot go with me, I shall not go. If either of us must go alone, it will be you. Her face lighted to a wondrous smile. Then we shall not be separated, she said, for I shall never leave you as long as we both live. He looked down into her face for a moment, and then, Who was Antak? he asked. My brother, she replied. Why? And then, even less than before, could he tell her. It was then that he did something he had never done before. He put his arms about her, and stooping, kissed her forehead. Until you find Antak, he said, I will be your brother. She drew away. I already have a brother, she said, and I do not want another. End of chapter 4、Chapter、Five of Out of Time's Abyss This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ralph Snelson. Out of Time's Abyss by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Five. Days became weeks, and weeks became months, and the months followed one another in a lazy procession of hot. Humid days and warm, humid nights. The fugitives never saw a Wieroo by day, though often at night they heard the melancholy flapping of giant wings far above them. Each day was much like its predecessor. Bradley splashed about for a few minutes in the cold pool early each morning, and after a time the girl tried it and liked it. Toward the center it was deep enough for swimming, 
and so he taught her to swim. She was probably the first human being in all Caspak's long ages who had done this thing. And then, while she prepared breakfast, the man shaved. This he never neglected. At first it was a source of wonderment to the girl, for the Galu men are beardless. When they needed meat, he hunted. Otherwise he busied himself in improving their shelter, making new and better weapons, perfecting his knowledge of the girl's language, and teaching her to speak and to write English, anything that would keep them both occupied. He still sought new plans for escape, but with ever-lessening enthusiasm, since each new scheme presented some insurmountable obstacle. And then one day, as a bolt out of a clear sky, came that which blasted the peace and security of their sanctuary forever. Bradley was just emerging from the water after his morning plunge, when from overhead came the sound of flapping wings. Glancing quickly up, the man saw a white-robed Wieroo circling slowly above him. That he had been discovered he could not doubt, since the creature even dropped to a lower altitude as though to assure itself that what it saw was a man. Then it rose rapidly and winged away toward the city. For two days Bradley and the girl lived in a constant state of apprehension, awaiting the moment when the hunters would come for them. But nothing happened until just after dawn of the third day, when the flapping of wings apprised them of the approach of Wieroos. Together they went to the edge of the wood, and looked up to see five red-robed creatures dropping slowly in ever-lessening spirals toward their little amphitheater. With no attempt at concealment they came, sure of their ability to overwhelm these two fugitives, and with the fullest measure of self-confidence they landed in the clearing, but a few yards from the man and the girl. Following a plan already discussed, Bradley and the girl retreated slowly into the woods. The Wieroos advanced, calling upon them to give themselves up, but the quarry made no reply. Farther and farther into the little wood Bradley led the hunters, permitting them to approach even closer. Then he circled back again toward the clearing, evidently to the great delight of the Wieroos, who now followed more leisurely, awaiting the moment when they should be beyond the trees and able to use their wings. They had opened into semicircular formation now, with the evident intention of cutting the two off from returning into the wood. Each Wieroo advanced with his curved blade ready in his hand, each hideous face blank and expressionless. It was then that Bradley opened fire with his pistol, three shots aimed with careful deliberation, for it had been long since he had used the weapon, and he could not afford to chance wasting ammunition on misses. At each shot a Wieroo dropped, and then the remaining two sought escape by flight, screaming and wailing after the manner of their kind. When a Wieroo runs, his wings spread almost without any volition upon his part, since from time immemorial he has always used them to balance himself and accelerate his running speed, so that in the open they appear to skim the surface of the ground when in the act of running. But here in the woods, among the close-set boles, the spreading of their wings proved their undoing. It hindered and stopped them, and threw them to the ground and then Bradley was upon them, threatening them with instant death if they did not surrender, promising them their freedom if they did his bidding. "'As you have seen,' he cried, "'I can kill you when I wish, and at a distance. You cannot escape me. Your only hope of life lies in obedience. Quick, or I kill.' The Wieroo stopped and faced him. "'What do you want of us?' asked one. "'Throw aside your weapons,' Bradley commanded. After a moment's hesitation, they obeyed. Now approach. A great plan, the only plan, had suddenly come to him like an inspiration. The Wieroos came closer and halted at his command. Bradley turned to the girl. There is a rope in the shelter, he said. Fetch it. She did as he bid, and then he directed her to fasten one end of a fifty-foot length to the ankle of one of the Wieroos and the opposite end to the second. The creatures gave evidence of great fear but they dared not attempt to prevent the act. "'Now go out into the clearing,' said Bradley, "'and remember that I am walking close behind, "'and that I will shoot the nearer one should either attempt to escape. "'That will hold the other until I can kill him as well.' "'In the open he halted them. 
the girl will get upon the back of the one in front announced the englishman i will mount the other she carries a sharp blade and i carry this weapon that you know kills easily at a distance if you disobey in the slightest the instructions that i am about to give you you shall both die that we must die with you will not deter us if you obey i promise to set you free without harming you you will carry us due west depositing us upon the shore of the mainland that is all it is the price of your lives do you agree sullenly the wieroos acquiesced bradley examined the knots that held the rope to their ankles and feeling them secure directed the girl to mount the back of the leading wieroo himself upon the other then he gave the signal for the two to rise together with loud flapping of the powerful wings the creatures took to the air circling once before they topped the trees upon the hill and then taking a course due west out over the waters of the sea nowhere about them could bradley see signs of other wieroos nor of those other menaces which he had feared might bring disaster to his plans for escape the huge winged reptilia that are so numerous above the southern areas of caspak and which are often seen though in lesser numbers farther north nearer and nearer loomed the mainland a broad park-like expanse stretching inland to the foot of a low plateau spread out before them the little dots in the foreground became grazing herds of deer and antelope and boss a huge woolly rhinoceros wallowed in a mud-hole to the right and beyond a mighty mammoth culled the tender shoots from a tall tree the roars and screams and growls of giant carnivora came faintly to their ears ah this was caspak with all its dangers and its primal savagery it brought a fullness to the throat of the englishman as to one who sees and hears the familiar sights and sounds of home after a long absence then the wieroos dropped swiftly downward to the flower-starred turf that grew almost to the water's edge the fugitives slipped from their backs and bradley told the red-robed creatures they were free to go when he had cut the ropes from their ankles they rose with that uncanny wailing upon their lips that always brought a shudder to the englishman and upon dismal wings they flapped away toward frightful oo when the creatures had gone the girl turned toward bradley why did you have them bring us here she asked now we are far from my country we may never live to reach it as we are among enemies who while not so horrible will kill us just as surely as would the wieroos should they capture us and we have before us many marches through lands filled with savage beasts there were two reasons replied bradley you told me that there are two wieroo cities at the eastern end of the island to have passed near either of them might have been to have brought about our heads hundreds of the creatures from whom we could not possibly have escaped again my friends must be near this spot it cannot be over two marches to the fort of which i have told you it is my duty to return to them if they still live we shall find a way to return you to your people and you asked the girl i escaped from oo replied bradley i have accomplished the impossible once and so i shall accomplish it again i shall escape from caspak he was not looking at her face as he answered her and so he did not see the shadow of sorrow that crossed her countenance when he raised his eyes again she was smiling what you wish i wish said the girl southward along the coast they made their way following the beach where the walking was best but always keeping close enough to trees to ensure sanctuary from the beasts and reptiles that so often menaced them it was late in the afternoon when the girl suddenly seized bradley's arm and pointed straight ahead along the shore what is that she whispered what strange reptile is it bradley looked in the direction her slim forefinger indicated he rubbed his eyes and looked again and then he seized her wrist and drew her quickly behind a clump of bushes what is it she asked it is the most frightful reptile that the waters of the world have ever known he replied it is a german u-boat an expression of amazement and understanding lighted her features it is the thing of which you told me she exclaimed the thing that swims under the water and carries men in its belly it is replied bradley 
"'Then why do you hide from it?' asked the girl. "'You said that now it belonged to your friends.' "'Many months have passed since I knew what was going on among my friends,' he replied. "'I cannot know what has befallen them. "'They should have been gone from here in this vessel long since, "'and so I cannot understand why it is still here. "'I am going to investigate first before I show myself.' When I left there were more Germans on the U-33 than there were men of my own party at the fort, and I have had sufficient experience of Germans to know that they will bear watching if they have not been properly watched since I left. Making their way through a fringe of wood that grew a few yards inland, the two crept unseen toward the U-boat, which lay moored to the shore at a point which Bradley now recognized as being near the oil pool north of Dinosaur. As close as possible to the vessel they halted, crouching low among the dense vegetation, and watched the boat for signs of human life about it. The hatches were closed. No one could be seen or heard. For five minutes Bradley watched, and then he determined to board the submarine and investigate. He had risen to carry his decision into effect when there suddenly broke upon his ear, uttered in loud and menacing tones, a volley of German oaths and expletives, among which he heard English a Schweinhunde repeated several times. The voice did not come from the direction of the U-boat, but from inland. Creeping forward, Bradley reached a spot where, through the creepers hanging from the trees, he could see a party of men coming down toward the shore. He saw Baron Friedrich von Schoenborgs and six of his men, all armed, while marching in a little knot among them were Olson, Brady, Sinclair, Wilson, and Whiteley. Bradley knew nothing of the disappearance of Bowen Tyler and Miss LaRue, nor of the perfidy of the Germans in shelling the fort and attempting to escape in the U-33, but he was in no way surprised at what he saw before him. The little party came slowly onward, the prisoners staggering beneath heavy cans of oil while Schwartz, one of the German non-commissioned officers, cursed and beat them with a stick of wood impartially. Von Schoenborgs walked in the rear of the column, encouraging Schwartz and laughing at the discomfiture of the Britishers. Dietz, Heinz, and Klotz also seemed to enjoy the entertainment immensely, but two of the men, Plesser and Hindle, marched with eyes straight to the front and with scowling faces. Bradley felt his blood boil at sight of the cowardly indignities being heaped upon his men, and in the brief span of time occupied by the column to come abreast of where he lay hidden, he made his plans, foolhardy though he knew them. Then he drew the girl close to him. "'Stay here,' he whispered. "'I am going out to fight those beasts, but I shall be killed. Do not let them see you. Do not let them take you alive.' They are more cruel, more cowardly, more bestial than the Wieroos. The girl pressed close to him, her face very white. Go, if that is right, she whispered, but if you die, I shall die, for I cannot live without you. He looked sharply into her eyes. Oh, he ejaculated, what an idiot I have been. Nor could I live without you, little girl. And he drew her very close and kissed her lips. Goodbye. He disengaged himself from her arms and looked again in time to see that the rear of the column had just passed him. Then he rose and leaped quickly and silently from the jungle. Suddenly von Schoenvorts felt an arm thrown about his neck, and his pistol jerked from its holster. He gave a cry of fright and warning, and his men turned to see a half-naked white man holding their leader securely from behind, and aiming a pistol at them over his shoulder. "'Drop those guns!' came in short, sharp syllables, and perfect German from the lips of the newcomer. "'Drop them, or I'll put a bullet through the back of von Schoenvorts' head.' The Germans hesitated for a moment, looking first toward von Schoenvorts, and then to Schwartz, who was evidently second in command for orders. "'It's the English pig, Bradley,' shouted the latter, "'and he's alone. Go and get him.' "'Go yourself,' growled Plesser. Hindle moved close to the side of Plesser and whispered something to him. The latter nodded. Suddenly von Schoenvorts wheeled about and seized Bradley's pistol arm with both hands. Now, he shouted, come and take him quick. Schwartz and three others leaped forward. 
but Plesser and Hindle held back, looking questioningly toward the English prisoners. Then Plesser spoke. "'Now is your chance, Englander,' he called in low tones. "'Seize Hindle and me and take our guns from us. We will not fight hard.' Olson and Brady were not long in acting upon the suggestion. They had seen enough of the brutal treatment von Schoenvorts accorded his men, and the especially venomous attentions he had taken great enjoyment in according Plesser and Hindel, to understand that these two might be sincere in a desire for revenge. In another moment the two Germans were unarmed, and Olson and Brady were running to the support of Bradley, but already it seemed too late. Von Schoenvorts had managed to drag the Englishman around so that his back was toward Schwartz and the other advancing Germans. Schwartz was almost upon Bradley with gun clubbed and ready to smash down upon the Englishman's skull. Brady and Olson were charging the Germans in the rear with Wilson, Whiteley, and Sinclair supporting them with bare fists. It seemed that Bradley was doomed when, apparently out of space, an arrow whizzed, striking Schwartz in the side, passing halfway through his body to crumple him to the earth. With a shriek the man fell, and at the same time Olson and Brady saw the slim figure of a young girl standing at the edge of the jungle, coolly fitting another arrow to her bow. Bradley had now succeeded in wrestling his arm free from von Schwernwert's grip, and in dropping the latter with a blow from the butt of his pistol. The rest of the English and Germans were engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter, Plesser and Hindle standing aside from the melee, and urging their comrades to surrender and join with the English against the tyranny of von Schoenvorts. Heinz and Klotz, possibly influenced by their exhortation, were putting up but a half-hearted resistance, but Dietz, a huge bearded bull-necked Prussian, yelling like a maniac, sought to exterminate the Englishweinhind with his bayonet, fearing to fire his piece lest he kill some of his comrades. It was Olson who engaged him, and though unused to the long German rifle and bayonet, he met the bulrush of the Hun with the cold, cruel precision and science of English bayonet fighting. There was no fainting, no retiring, and no parrying that was not also an attack. Bayonet fighting today is not a pretty thing to see. It is not an artistic fencing match in which men give and take. It is slaughter, inevitable, and quickly over. Dietz lunged once madly at Olson's throat. A short point, with just a twist of the bayonet to the left, sent the sharp blade over the Englishman's left shoulder. Instantly he stepped close in, dropped his rifle through his hands, and grasped it with both hands close below the muzzle, and with a short, sharp jab sent his blade up beneath Dietz's chin to the brain. So quickly was the thing done, and so quick the withdrawal, that Olson had wheeled to take on another adversary before the German's corpse had toppled to the ground. But there were no more adversaries to take on. Hines and Klotz had thrown down their rifles, and with hands above their heads were crying, Kamerad, Kamerad, at the tops of their voices. Von Schoenvorts still lay where he had fallen. Plesser and Hindle were explaining to Bradley that they were glad of the outcome of the fight, as they could no longer endure the brutality of the U-boat commander. The remainder of the men were looking at the girl, who now advanced slowly, her bow ready, when Bradley turned toward her and held out his hand. Cotan, he said, unstring your bow. These are my friends and yours. And to the Englishman, this is Cotan. You who saw her save me from Schwartz know a part of what I owe her. The rough men gathered about the girl, and when she spoke to them in broken English, with a smile upon her lips, enhancing the charm of her irresistible accent, each and every one of them promptly fell in love with her, and constituted himself henceforth her guardian and her slave. A moment later the attention of each was called to Plesser by a volley of invective. They turned in time to see the man running toward von Schoenvorts, who was just rising from the ground. Plesser carried a rifle with bayonet fixed that he had snatched from the side of Dietz's corpse. Von Schoenvorts' face was livid with fear his jaws working as though he would call for help, but no sound came from his blue lips. "'You struck me!' shrieked Plesser. "'Once, twice, three times you struck me, pig! You murdered Schwerk! 
You drove him insane by your cruelty until he took his own life. You are only one of your kind. They are all like you from the Kaiser down. I wish that you were the Kaiser. That's what I do. And he lunged his bayonet through von Schoenvart's chest. Then he let his rifle fall with the dying man and wheeled toward Bradley. Here I am, he said. Do with me as you like. All my life I have been kicked and cuffed by such as that, and yet always I have gone out when they commanded, singing to give up my life if need be to keep them in power. Only lately have I come to know what a fool I have been. But now I am no longer a fool, and besides I am avenged and Sverk is avenged, so you can kill me if you wish. Here I am. If I was after being the king, said Olson, I'd pin the V.C. on your noble chest. But being only an Irishman of its a three name for which God forgive me, the best I can do is shake your hand. You will not be punished, said Bradley. There are four of you left. If you four want to come along and work with us, we will take you, but you will come as prisoners. It suits me, said Plesser. Now that the Captain Lieutenant is dead, you need not fear us. All our lives we have known nothing but to obey his class. If I had not killed him, I suppose I would be fool enough to obey him again. But he is dead. Now we will obey you. We must obey someone. And you, Bradley turned to the other survivors of the original crew of the U-33, each promised obedience. The two dead Germans were buried in a single grave, and then the party boarded the submarine and stowed away the oil. Here Bradley told the men what had befallen him since the night of September 14th, when he had disappeared so mysteriously from the camp upon the plateau. Now he learned for the first time that Bowen J. Tyler, Jr., and Miss LaRue had been missing even longer than he, and that no faintest trace of them had been discovered. Olson told him of how the Germans had returned and waited in ambush for them outside the fort, capturing them that they might be used to assist in the work of refining the oil and later in manning the U-33, and Plesser told briefly of the experiences of the German crew under von Schoenvort since they had escaped from Kaspak months before, of how they lost their bearings after having been shelled by ships they had attempted to sneak farther north, and how at last, with provisions gone and fuel almost exhausted, they had sought and at last found, more by accident than design, the mysterious island they had once been so glad to leave behind. Now, announced Bradley, we'll plan for the future. The boat has fuel, provisions, and water for a month, I believe you said, Plesser. There are ten of us to man it. We have a last sad duty here. We must search for Miss LaRue and Mr. Tyler. I say a sad duty because we know that we shall not find them. But it is none the less our duty to comb the shoreline, firing signal shells at intervals, that we at least may leave at last with full knowledge that we have done all that men might do to locate them. None dissented from this conviction, nor was there a voice raised in protest against the plan to at least make assurance doubly sure before quitting Caspak forever. And so they started, cruising slowly up the coast and firing an occasional shot from the gun. Often the vessel was brought to a stop, and always there were anxious eyes scanning the shore for an answering signal. Late in the afternoon they caught sight of a number of Bandu warriors, but when the vessel approached the shore and the natives realized that human beings stood upon the back of the strange monster of the sea, they fled in terror before Bradley could come within hailing distance. That night they dropped anchor at the mouth of a sluggish stream whose warm waters swarmed with millions of tiny tadpole-like organisms, minute human spawn, starting on their precarious journey from some inland pool toward the beginning, a journey which one in millions might perhaps survive to complete. Already, almost at the inception of life, they were being greeted by thousands of voracious mouths as fish and reptiles of many kinds fought to devour them. 
the while other and larger creatures pursued the devourers, to be in turn preyed upon by some other of the countless forms that inhabit the deeps of Caprona's frightful sea. The second day was practically a repetition of the first. They moved very slowly, with frequent stops, and once they landed in the Krolu country to hunt. Here they were attacked by the bow and arrow men, whom they could not persuade to palaver with them. So belligerent were the natives that it became necessary to fire into them in order to escape their persistent and ferocious attentions. "'What chance,' asked Bradley, as they were returning to the boat with their game, "'could Tyler and Miss Larue have had among such as these?' But they continued on their fruitless quest, and the third day, after cruising along the shore of a deep inlet, they passed a line of lofty cliffs that formed the southern shore of the inlet, and rounded a sharp promontory about noon. Cotan and Bradley were on deck alone, and as the new shoreline appeared beyond the point, the girl gave an exclamation of joy and seized the man's hand in hers. "'Oh, look!' she cried. "'The Galu country! The Galu country! It is my country that I never thought to see again!' "'You are glad to come again, Cotan? asked Bradley. "'Oh, so glad!' she cried. "'And you will come with me to my people. "'We may live here among them, and you will be a great warrior. "'Oh, when Jor dies you may even be chief, "'for there is none so mighty as my warrior. "'You will come?' "'Bradley shook his head. "'I cannot, little Cotan. he answered. "'My country needs me, and I must go back.' Maybe some day I shall return. You will not forget me, Cotan? She looked at him in wide-eyed wonder. You are going away from me? She asked in a very small voice. You are going away from Cotan? Bradley looked down upon the little bowed head. He felt the soft cheek against his bare arm, and he felt something else there, too. Hot drops of moisture that ran down to his very fingertips and splashed, but each one wrung from a woman's heart. He bent low and raised the tear-stained face to his own. No, Cotan, he said, I am not going away from you, for you are going with me. You are going back to my own country to be my wife. Tell me that you will, Cotan. And he bent still lower yet from his height and kissed her lips. Nor did he need more than the wonderful new light in her eyes to tell him that she would go to the end of the world with him, if he would but take her. And then the gun crew came up from below again to fire a signal shot, and the two were brought down from the high heaven of their new happiness to the scarred and weather-beaten deck of the U-33. An hour later the vessel was running close in by a shore of wondrous beauty beside a park-like meadow that stretched back a mile inland to the foot of a plateau when Whiteley called attention to a score of figures clamoring downward from the elevation to the lowland below. The engines were reversed and the boat brought to a stop while all hands gathered on deck to watch the little party coming toward them across the meadow. "'They are gallows!' cried Cotan. They are my own people. Let me speak to them, lest they think we come to fight them. Put me ashore, my man, and I will go meet them. The nose of the U-boat was run close in to the steep bank, but when Cotan would have run forward alone, Bradley seized her hand and held her back. I will go with you, Cotan, he said, and together they advanced to meet the oncoming party. There were about twenty warriors moving forward in a thin line, as our infantry advance as skirmishers. Bradley could not but notice the marked difference between this formation and the mob-like methods of the lower tribes he had come in contact with, and he commented upon it to Cotan. "'Galu warriors always advance into battle thus,' she said. "'The lesser people remain in a huddled group, where they can scarce use their weapons, the while they present so big a mark to us that our spears and arrows cannot miss them, but when they hurl theirs at our warriors, if they miss the first man, there is no chance that they will kill someone behind him. Stand still now, she cautioned, and fold your arms. They will not harm us then. Bradley did as he was bid, and the two stood with arms folded as the line of warriors approached. When they had come within some fifty yards, they halted, and one spoke. 
"'Who are you, and from whence do you come?' he asked. And then Kotan gave a little glad cry and sprang forward with outstretched arms. "'Oh, Tan!' she exclaimed. "'Do you not know your little Kotan?' The warrior stared, incredulous for a moment, and then he too ran forward, and when they met took the girl in his arms. It was then that Bradley experienced to the full a sensation that was new to him, a sudden hatred for the strange warrior before him, and a desire to kill without knowing why he would kill. He moved quickly to the girl's side and grasped her wrist. "'Who is this man?' he demanded in cold tones. Cotan turned a surprised face toward the Englishman, and then of a sudden broke forth into a merry peal of laughter. "'This is my father, Bradley,' she cried. "'And who is Bradley?' demanded the warrior. "'He is my man,' replied Cotan simply. "'By what right?' insisted Tan. And then she told him briefly of all that she had passed through since the Wieroos had stolen her and of how Bradley had rescued her and sought to rescue Antak, her brother. "'You are satisfied with him?' asked Tan. "'Yes,' replied the girl proudly. It was then that Bradley's attention was attracted to the edge of the plateau by a movement there, and looking closely he saw a horse bearing two figures sliding down the steep declivity. Once at the bottom the animal came charging across the meadowland at a rapid run, it was a magnificent animal, a great bay stallion, with a white blazed face and white forelegs to the knees, its barrel encircled by a broad surcingle of white, and as it came to a sudden stop beside Tan, the Englishman saw that it bore a man and a girl, a tall man and a girl as beautiful as Kotan. When the girl espied the latter, she slid from the horse and ran toward her, fairly screaming for joy. The man dismounted and stood beside Tan. Like Bradley, he was garbed after the fashion of the surrounding warriors, but there was a subtle difference between him and his companion. Possibly he detected a similar difference in Bradley, for his first question was, From what country? And though he spoke in Galu, Bradley thought he detected an accent. England, replied Bradley. A broad smile lighted the newcomer's face as he held out his hand. I am Tom Billings of Santa Monica, California, he said. I know all about you, and I'm mighty glad to find you alive. How did you get here? asked Bradley. I thought ours was the only party of men from the outer world ever to enter Caprona. It was until we came in search of Bowen J. Tyler, Jr., replied Billings. We found him and sent him home with his bride, but I was kept a prisoner here. Bradley's face darkened. Then they were not among friends after all. There are ten of us down there on a German sub, with small arms and a gun, he said quickly in English. It will be no trick to get away from these people. You don't know my jailer, replied Billings, or you'd not be so sure. Wait, I'll introduce you. And then turning to the girl who had accompanied him, he called her by name. Ajor, he said, permit me to introduce Lieutenant Bradley. Lieutenant, Mrs. Billings, my jailer. The Englishman laughed as he shook hands with the girl. "'You are not as good a soldier as I,' he said to Billings. "'Instead of being taken prisoner myself, I have taken one. Mrs. Bradley, this is Mr. Billings.' Ajor, quick to understand, turned toward Cotan. "'You are going back with him to his country?' she asked. Cotan admitted it. "'You dare?' asked Ajor. "'But your father will not permit it.' "'Jor, my father, high chief of the Galus, will not permit it, for like me you are cos O oh, Kotan, if we but could! How I would love to see all the strange and wonderful things of which my Tom tells me!' Bradley bent and whispered in her ear, "'Say the word, and you may both go with us.' Billings heard, and speaking in English, asked Ajor if she would go. "'Yes,' she answered, "'if you wish it.' But you know, my Tom, that if Jor captures us, both you and Kotan's man will pay the penalty with your lives. Not even his love for me nor his admiration for you can save you. Bradley noticed that she spoke in English, broken English, like Kotan's, but equally appealing. We can easily get you aboard the ship, he said, on some pretext or other, 
and then we can steam away. They can neither harm nor detain us, nor will we have to fire a shot at them. And so it was done, Bradley and Cotan taking Ajor and Billings aboard to show them the vessel, which almost immediately raised anchor and moved slowly out into the sea. I hate to do it, said Billings. They have been fine to me. Jor and Tan are splendid men, and they will think me an ingrate. But I can't waste my life here when there is much to be done in the outer world. As they steamed down the inland sea past the island of Uo, the stories of their adventures were retold, and Bradley learned that Bowen Tyler and his bride had left the Galu country but a fortnight before and that there was every reason to believe that the Toreador might still be lying in the Pacific, not far off the subterranean mouth of the river which emitted Caprona's heated waters into the ocean. Late in the second day, after running through swarms of hideous reptiles, they submerged at the point where the river entered beneath the cliffs, and shortly after rose to the sunlit surface of the Pacific but nowhere as far as they could see was sign of another craft. Down the coast they steamed toward the beach where Billings had made his crossing in the hydro aeroplane, and just at dusk the lookout announced a light dead ahead. It proved to be aboard the Toreador, and a half hour later there was such a reunion on the deck of the trigged little yacht as no one there had ever dreamed might be possible. Of the Allies there were only Tippet and James to be mourned, and no one mourned any of the Germans dead, nor Benson the traitor, whose ugly story was first told in Bowen Tyler's manuscript. Tyler and the rescue party had but just reached the yacht that afternoon. They had heard faintly the signal shots fired by the U-33, but had been unable to locate their direction, and so had assumed that they had come from the guns of the Toreador. It was a happy party that sailed north toward sunny southern California, the old U-33 trailing in the wake of the Toreador, and flying with the latter the glorious stars and stripes, beneath which she had been born in the shipyard at Santa Monica. Three newly married couples, their bonds now duly solemnized by the master of the ship, joyed in the peace and security of the untracked waters of the South Pacific, and the unique honeymoon which, had it not been for stern duty ahead, they could have wished protracted till the end of time and so they came one day to dock at the shipyard which Bowen Tyler now controlled, and here the U-33 still lies, while those who pass so many eventful days within, and because of her, have gone their various ways. End of chapter 5 End of Out of Time's Abyss